and, and Professor Huang for, for uh, moderating those questions. The last scientific talk of today is from Professor Yang Shaohorn, who's the WM Keck Professor of Energy at the Massachusetts University, uh, Massachusetts Institute of Technology. Her work centered, uh, it centers on using chemical physics to understand and control molecular reaction details for the dynamics and electri electrified interface and transport properties for sustainable energy and chemicals. Uh, she also serves on the MIT EI Energy Council and is co-director for the MIT Low Carbon Energy Storage Center. Um, Professor Schauhorn, the floor is yours. I really look forward to your talk. Thank you. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. I'm delighted to be here to celebrate John's 98th birthday. I want to thank the organizers for the symposium. John, happy birthday. John is extremely supportive of young scientists and women scientists. My first encounter with John was at uh, the Women in Material Science Engineering breakfast at MRS. John looks very happy, surrounded by women scientists in this photo taken at ECS a few years ago. And John is always approachable, and very generous with his time, advice, and knowledge. And sometimes even it would uh, break his uh, good routine and good habits and stay up to have late dinner with a group of enthusiastic young scientists. I will start by uh, with John's advice to discover the next breakthrough. Develop your own scientific vision and voice, enjoy what you do and believe the importance of your explorations. Be curious and ask questions. Challenge conventional thinking compete against problems, not people, collaborate, and have an open mind. I came to know John through our collaboration on electrocatalysis, uh, catalyzing oxygen reduction and oxygen evolution. And this is a group of uh, people whom I work with at MIT, Jean Sandwich, um, graduate, uh, PhD student in material science back then and now professor at Cornell. Now Aki Abuchi, a postdoc and now professor at Yokohama National University. Hubert Gastegger, visiting professor and now professor at Technical University of Munich. We were looking at uh, a series of perovskite oxides and uh, we're examining the catalytic activity for oxygen reduction and looking for a descriptor of activity uh, for these oxides. Jing observed an interesting observation where the activity for oxygen reduction for these oxides exhibit a volcano trend as function of antibonding electron filling for the transition metal ions, namely EG electrons. And he proposed the following to explain this volcano trend where the EG electrons can regulate the energetics between absorbates and then transition metal sites on the surface. Right? For oxygen reduction, essentially we need to go through a few reaction intermediates, uh, oxygen, absorbed oxygen, OOH, O and OH minus. For the left hand side of the volcano where the binding strength is strong, where generation of OH minus can be limiting. On the right hand side of the volcano, the absorption strength is weak, where absorption of oxygen can be very limiting. We were very excited about this concept, but we're very afraid that this concept was you know, fundamentally flawed. So we had to check with someone uh, who knows an oxide electronic structure. I recall approaching John with trepidation in a conference. John was very approachable and he listened. And that was incredible, right? Because I don't come across as a, a credible scientist. I, in fact, uh, uh, recently I had uh, my 30 year high school graduation reunion uh, in Beijing, China. Uh, where I came to connect with some of my high school classmates for the first time after 30 years. So what are you doing in the US? I responded, teaching. Then my classmates uh, followed teaching English. 
to our pleasant surprise, uh, John largely agreed with uh, this concept, but corrected that surface spin state for some transition metal ions can be significantly different from bulk, uh, which is important to correct and uh, uh, consider for catalysis. Then we went on and also reported that EG electron filling can also govern the uh, catalytic activity for water splitting. John is easy to work with. As long as you can understand him and understand his handwriting. He's very dedicated to collaborations and dedicated to science. So this is one example of his uh, uh, early edits for this manuscript. Unfortunately, we were not able to utilize much of his edits for this paper uh, due to the length and the format requirement of this journal. John went along and didn't really say much about it. Uh, but since ever after, uh, every time I would meet John in person and John would uh, gently mention this to me, Young, you don't like my writing. The fact is not I don't like John's writing, it is very, very often my thinking is many, many years behind. I want to point out John's writing here. The dependence may be used as a guide to the identification of oxide catalysts having a Fermi energy penned at the top of oxygen P bands for these reactions. Certainly back then, a decade ago, I didn't know what this meant, nor we had any experimental computational evidence in support of the statement. Only many years after, uh, six or seven years after, we were able to use DFT and X-ray absorption, X-ray emission spectroscopy to measure out the unoccupied states and the occupied state of metal and oxygen with a series of uh, perovskites, where we can show as we lower the Fermi level into the oxygen P band, where we change and decrease the charge transfer energy of these oxide, we increase catalytic activity for oxygen evolution. And indeed, for these most active catalysts for water splitting, the Fermi level is pinned on top of uh, the O2P band. In addition, we were able to show for these oxides with Fermi level pinned on top of O2P band, not only the metal sites can be active, uh, but also surface oxygen sites can be equal equally active for catalyzing water splitting and oxygen evolution. And more recently, we have extended this concept to understand the electrolyte oxidation for positive electrode materials in lithium ion batteries. So as we lower the Fermi level into the oxygen P band or into the ligand P band center, we decrease the driving force for oxidation of electrolyte solvent, where we essentially we have a solvent uh, interfacing with a highly reactive uh, oxide surface. And this driving force for this uh, oxidation occurs by a oxidative dehydrogenation reaction, where EC molecule come to the surface and where we're able to strip a hydrogen from EC and generate a proton on surface oxygen and the remaining fragment absorbed on a nearby oxygen. And simultaneously, the surface metal ions are being reduced. And this oxidative dehydrogenation was supported directly uh, through uh, in-situ FTIR measurements. As we charge uh, NMC811 about uh, 4 volt, we see additional signals at a higher frequency to that of EC uh, occurs. And this signal comes from vanillin carbonate. And we can form vanillin carbonate by stripping two hydrogen from EC and form a double bond. So utilizing this concept, if you want to design a stable a surfaces uh, with the minimum reactivity to oxidize electrolytes, then we will want to have a surfaces with a very high 
formula away from the ligand P band center to minimize electrolyte oxidation and increase the cycle life of batteries. So over the past decade, uh, through collaboration with Zhang, also uh, being inspired through his work, that we have developed a unique scientific voice in using oxide electronic structure to design catalytic activity and uh, interfacial reactivity, ranging from oxygen reduction, oxygen evolution in basic solution to surface exchange kinetics at oxide-oxide interface uh, to uh, oxidation of CO to CO2, the oxidation of uh, NO to NO2, and of course, uh, designing uh, the oxide surfaces and organic molecules. These interactions for either minimize oxidation of electrolyte in lithium ion batteries or designing selective oxidation uh, of various fuels uh, for chemical transfer tran uh, transformation. Beyond electronic structure, uh, we have began to study lattice dynamics and try to measure and compute phonon, phonon density states and correlate the phonon band center with the barrier of ion migration. Uh, the work of Seiha Mui has shown if we lower the lithium phonon band center, uh, it comes with a reduced barrier for lithium ion migration for a series of lithium conductors. Similar trend has shown also for sodium ion conductors in collaboration with Wolfgang Zeyer. So these correlations beg the question, can we use the phonon band center of the mobile species as a descriptor to design ion mobility? And can we utilize the descriptor to predict new uh, ionic uh, compounds? Through collaboration with Johannes Voss at Slack, we were able to screen and compute over 1,000 lithium-containing compounds in the inorganic database. And in particular, we're looking for uh, compounds with low lithium phonon band center because we know it's correlated with reduced migration barrier. Coupling phonon density states with electronic density states, we were able to uh, predict uh, 18 new ion conductors that should have a large gam band gap, also a good uh, ion conductivity. And some of these compounds were validated experimentally, exhibiting reasonably high ion conductivity. So this is one approach for some of us um, who might not have the uh, physical intuition like John, who can directly report uh, Nisicon, which is one of the, the pannier compound uh, for the sodium uh, superconducting uh, ion conductors. So the last example I want to show is where we begin to combine oxide electronic structure and oxide lattice dynamics to understand what's the physical origin to design lattice oxygen redox. Lithium rich uh, transition metal oxide panniered by Mike Thackeray uh, provides greater discharge capacity uh, than the stoichiometric layered compounds. And this extra capacity has been attributed to lattice oxygen redox. Like many other groups, uh, such as Jean-Marie Tarscon, we also utilize lithium ruthenate, lithium-2, lithium-03 as a model system to understand what electronic uh, signatures or features or phonon features that would enable more of the lattice re oxygen redox uh, and the minimize oxygen loss or oxygen evolution so we can uh, increase the reversible lattice oxygen redox and increase discharge capacity. So if we have lattice oxygen redox or oxygen-oxygen coupling, we might expect the formation of the OO antibonding uh, and bonding states, uh, sigma and uh, sigma star. And we did uncover unique uh, spectra of features related to oxygen oxygen coupling in lithium ruthenate. And in particular, shown on top, we have the ruthenium L X ray absorption edge, where we see the increased intensity uh, towards a higher photon energy. 
And this higher, this increased intensity can be attributed to the formation of the OO sigma star uh, anti-bounding states hybridized with ruthenium 4D. In addition, there's a broadening in the X-ray emission spectroscopy of the oxygen K edge. And this is as a result of the formation of OO sigma bound, a sigma states uh, due to the coupling. And these assignments uh, has been confirmed and verified uh, directly through a density functional theory calculation of these spectra using the ocean code. Beyond the electronic a structure signature of all coupling, we also observed a unique phonon spectra changes. Removing lithium from lithium ruthenate, uh, we didn't see the creation of uh, the characteristic frequency related to oxygen dimers, like what we see typically for lithium manganite, right? This signal around 1000. Instead, for lithium ruthenate, we see there is hardening of oxygen-oxygen stretching. And this indicative of a stronger oxygen-oxygen interactions within the oxide lattice. We propose that the hardening of oxygen phonon or oxygen-oxygen interactions facilitated by stronger metal oxygen bonds is the key to enable reversible lattice oxygen redox, as we have seen for uranium and ruthenium uh, oxides. On the other hand, for lithium transition metal oxides uh, with significant oxygen loss during charging, uh, is accompanied with oxygen phonon softening and the formation of this oxygen dimers uh, in solids and eventually uh, could lead to oxygen loss and doing cycling and the irreversible uh, uh, oxygen uh, redox. So therefore we want to design and find the structures or metal uh, oxygen strong interactions to be able to stabilize the OO coupling within the solid matrix. So I want to end by uh, coming back to John's advice John, I want to thank you for inspiring us and uh, encouraging us to develop our own scientific uh, vision. And I want to thank you uh, for encourage us to challenge conventional thinking, uh, compete against problem, and that people uh, collaborate and have open mind. I want to add, add to John's list, and that is to eat more chocolates. Based on this highly cited article from New England Journal of Medicine, increasing chocolate consumption would increase the number of Nobel laureates per 10 million population. US is here, China is here. Clearly, if we want to do better science, we need to eat more chocolates. Considering the favorite candy in Texas is candy corn, I find it's quite remarkable that John went to Stockholm last year. Had John worked in Arizona, for example, and uh, John probably would have won the Nobel Prize years earlier. Happy birthday, John, and thank you very much. Oh, okay. Uh, thank you so much, Professor Sao Hong. Yeah, uh, you, sh you share the impressive story with Professor Good Enough. As a postdoc or the students or professor, uh, we also have the same experience. And he always, I mean, correct paper for us. And his handwriting is very special. So many people, they want to ask not an academic question, it's a sign. The female scientists or the younger scientists, as Professor Good Enough, he always encourages the, the, the younger students or the female uh, scientists. So could you please give some advices uh, based on, on your experience, yeah. 
I, I could say no more than what advice uh, John has given. Uh, develop uh, one's own scientific voice. And I think the journey is very important and uh, willing to, uh, to, to try one's ideas and uh, challenge conventional thinking and ask questions, collaborate to learn from others and uh, keep trying and work hard. <laughs> Uh, any more? Maybe, maybe ask the professor good enough. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Say, thanks again for your story and uh, your contribution to our symposium. Thanks. Thank you. Yes. So now we come to the closing remarks. Wonderful. Um, so Professor Goodenough and Professor Mantharam are both here. Um, Professor Goodenough, uh, do you do you have uh, any any remarks uh, at this point? I, I think we'd like to have some last words from you if you have. And please turn on the microphone. Um, beginning. Let's start from the beginning. I thank all the participants, speakers, the friends who sent me birthday wishes, and Wiley Publications for organizing this symposium on my 98th birthday. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you very much. Of course, I think it's in on the honor is ours to have been able to be present and help celebrate your birthday with you. Um, so we very much appreciate it. Uh, Professor Mantharam, do you do you have uh, any any final? Yes. Yes. So we made it. First, I thank Wiley Publishers, particularly John uh, Willrich, for making the two special issues and this symposium possible. Second, I thank all the speakers for their kindness to share their research perspectives on a Saturday instead of spending time with their families. Third, I thank Yun Ye Huang for all his hard work with his students and working hard with John. Finally, I thank John for providing me the opportunity to work with him both at Oxford as well as at UT Austin and for all the education and mentoring I received from him over the years. Apart from science, the best lesson I learned from John is be humble. Be modest, be generous, and do not trumpet. Happy birthday to John again. Thank you. Thank you, Ram. Thank you very Thank much. You. Thank you.